Thank you, Barb. Thank you. <laughs> Do we have any introductions or birthdays? It's my birthday. Happy birthday. Are there any others? <laughs> I think you share this uh, birthday with Stephen Haynes, Jenna Lou. Yeah. And Eleanor Roosevelt. All right. <laughs> I think Andrea's, I think Andrea Takarati's birthday is today. Ah. Any well, other? yeah. Shall we sing? Happy Thank you. <laughs> we don't have any introductions today. I'll, we can move on to announcements. Does anyone have any they want to start with? Well, I'll start. <laughs> um, Cincinnati Friends Meeting is gonna be sponsoring a special two-part class on the Palestinian-Israeli situation. Who's gonna be a guest speaker, Maxwell Carter. Um, it's called From the Midwest to the Mideast, a personal encounter with the Palestinian-Israeli situation. The dates for that are October 20th and uh, October 27th, both Tuesdays um, at, from about seven o'clock to 8.30. Um, you can register for this and get a Zoom link by emailing Kristen Lally. And you can also check out Max's book, not necessary to be part of the class, but you can check it out if you're interested. Um, I believe Heather has dropped all of that into the chat. So check that out if you're interested. Look for more information. Some of you. Yeah, some of you may be aware that my wife is an occasional author uh, and Friends United Press has uh, chosen to release uh, her first series as, uh, as second editions 
those are now available at the French United Press website uh, and on Amazon. Um, the title of the first book, the only one that's available right now is I Was a Stranger uh, and the author is Patricia Thomas uh, and our own Becky Bowman did the artwork uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the cover. So um, check it out if you'd like. I will just uh, share a brief reminder that today after meeting for worship um, and a brief break, we will be meeting, I believe, to um, talk about how we can improve in the future, see how things are going. Um, I think, I believe that's the case and I, I don't think there were any other things on the docket. Did anyone have any other announcements before we move on? Gotta scroll through all of your faces. <laughs> all right, then I'm going to for the gathering moment. Hope cannot be wrestled to the ground, taken in by the power of our persuasions. In minuscule moments, brief encounters, little kindness given or withheld, we discover whether or not we have the capacity for Christ's coming. Whether or not we have the courage to reach past old disappointments and welcome the new, I wonder how will we do? How will we relax our grip and receive the gift that awaits to be given? I was mentioned. Now is the microphone working? Is the microphone working? Yes, it's working. Okay, thank you. Ready? God has shown me. mission this week is really quick. It's a reminder that we are raising money for Turkana Friends Mission. Turkana Friends Mission is all the way up in the northwestern corner of Kenya, and we are hoping to raise $700. That is enough to send two girls to school for a year who otherwise wouldn't get to go to school. So I believe we've, we've raised over $400 now, and we have till the end of the month. So keep collecting your change. Keep working at it, I think we'll get there. 
Jillian, are you ready for the children's message? Okay, so we are gonna try a three-person children's message. We'll see how it goes. Jillian has the book to show the pictures to friends here at Quaker Knoll. Um, Rachel is going to screen share from her phone and I'm going to read it off of a PowerPoint. If this works, it'll be great. If it doesn't work, I won't be all that surprised, but we'll figure it out. Rachel, are you ready to screen share? Yes, can you see it? <laughs> I can see it, yes. Okay. Okay. So this is the book that we started with last week, but we only did the first part of it. It's called Exodus. So the mother of Moses, you gonna open it to the first page? Yeah, there you go. A brave woman named Jochebed placed Moses in the basket in the Nile to keep him safe from Pharaoh's army. And an Egyptian princess found him and adopted him. Um, so Moses did not like the way that the Hebrew slaves, slaves were treated. And he tried to fix that problem by um, killing an Egyptian guard. That was how he thought maybe he should respond to injustice. Flip. And it didn't work. And Moses ran away from Egypt as a refugee. Out in the wilderness as a shepherd, Moses saw something really amazing. It was so holy that God told him to take off his shoes because he needed to show a sign of respect. It was the presence of God in a bush that blazed with fire, but it wasn't burned up. God told Moses to go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let God's people go. Pharaoh didn't like that idea. Slaves are free labor. He didn't want to release the slaves, so he asked for a sign from this God that he didn't know anything about. Moses' brother Aaron threw a staff on the ground and the staff turned into a snake. That turned out to be not all that special because all of Pharaoh's counselors could do it too. But then Aaron's snake ate all the rest of the snakes, so he still totally won that. But Pharaoh still said no. So God sent more plagues. There were frogs, and there were locusts, and flies, and hail. And then when it was obvious that Pharaoh would say no forever, the last plague killed every firstborn son in Egypt. And then Pharaoh said they could go. God passed over the houses that were marked with the lamb's blood. The Hebrew people left Egypt at night at Pharaoh's command. A pillar of cloud led the Hebrews by day and a pillar of fire guided them at night. So that didn't last. Pharaoh changed his mind and he tried to bring the Hebrews back into slavery, but God parted the Red Sea to let them pass through to safety. And Pharaoh's army was swept away. God covered the ground with food for them. It was white like snow and it tasted like honey. And the Hebrews called it manna. God sent birds for them too, called quail. They're a little smaller than chickens. They're good for eating. And God gave them water too right out of a rock. God made sure that they had everything that they needed. The Hebrews were journeying through the wilderness to get to Mount Sinai. There they saw lightning and flame and they heard thunder and trumpets. And Moses climbed all the way up to the mountain in order to receive the covenant. Do you know what a covenant is? No, a covenant is a promise but like a really serious kind of promise. So not like, sure, I'll pick you up from school, but like, I'll always be there for you, that kind of promise. So that's what God and Moses were doing up on the mountain. What do you think the people of Israel were doing while they were waiting? Watching them? It took them a long time to get this covenant. It's chapters and chapters in the Bible. And the Hebrew people, they got scared and angry so Aaron collected all of their golden jewelry and melted it down and made a golden calf for them to worship. That seems kind of silly, right? He said, 
this is the golden calf that brought you out of Egypt. Moses was really angry. He broke the special tablets that had the Ten Commandments on them, and then he destroyed the golden calf. They're not supposed to worship idols. But God forgave them and gave them a new copy of the laws. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for your patience with us, for the faithful way that you lead us. Lord, make us responsive when you call. Amen. Friends, do we have praises and concerns this morning? Um, earlier this week, my mom's mom, who is in a nursing care facility, uh, was diagnosed with COVID or tested positive for COVID. And it has been a rocky week. Today happens to be a really good day. Yesterday was not at all a good day. Um, so just keep her in your thoughts. Um, she is in a high risk category. I'm sorry to hear that. Along those same lines, uh, you probably are aware of a major COVID outbreak in a nursing facility in Hillsboro. Um, so Highland County had been uh, hit less hard than Clinton County so far, but uh, now it seems that the shoe was on the other foot. I have a praise to share. Um, my sister, I had mentioned her in um, Praises and Concerns a while back. She was expecting a baby and the baby came Friday evening, um, a little boy. And um, they were excited to finally be through this with COVID and everything. He's doing well. He is unnamed as of yet. I guess they try and figure out what his little personality is gonna be before they name him, but um, mom and baby and are doing well. So thanks for your prayers throughout this time. Um, our ne elderly neighbor, Bill Wood, fell off a ladder on his head on Friday and passed away. Um, his grandson found him, and it's just a very, very sad situation. So I ask for prayers for the Wood family um, as they grieve and uh, figure out what to do about their lives now with gr Grandpa gone. Praise uh, that um, uh, the presidential search at Wilmington College is uh, moving forward step by step. Uh, they completed four interviews uh, on campus uh, next week, or excuse me, last week, and uh, they will very shortly uh, turn the um, final list over to the board of trustees. Uh, for the for the board to choose the next co president of Wilmington College. We have had a dramatic change of scenery because the rain picked up. So we are now in the shed rather than at the fire pit. 
Um, I want to want to make sure that we remember the family of Mary Catherine Hilberg passed away and um, I don't know anything yet about services, but when I do know, I will pass that information along. We have other praises and concerns to share. If not, then will you turn with me to God in prayer? Holy God, unseen, invisible to our eyes and yet present with us in all of creation, in starry skies and glorious sunshine and in rain, in oceans and mountains and forests and fields of flowers, in the stories of scripture, and with us most fully in the person of Jesus who lived and walked among us and who revealed your love for us. Lord, your desire is for us to focus our eyes and hearts on you to follow your lead. And yet too often, like those before us, we lose our focus and we turn away focusing instead on golden calves, on idols. Examine us, Lord, and root out our idols. Living Christ, forgive us as you forgave your people Israel, and forgive us as we forgive one another. Lord, the journey is long. We get lost, we get fed up, we get weary. We get fearful. Help us to keep our focus on you. To find ways of supporting each other and helping each other to keep moving forward. Keep us hopeful and confident and ready to listen for your still small voice. Through the day, lead us with your cloud in paths of wisdom and justice. And through the night, lead us with your fire in paths of mercy and love. We offer our gifts this morning, our time and talent and treasure, and we ask that you take them and use them to bring power to the powerless, to spread healing and raise people out of poverty, to be put to work to bring equality and justice in our world, to bring your kingdom here and now. We pray this in the name of Christ who invites us into the kingdom. Amen.
Thanks, Barb. So the first reading that we have today is called The Deal by Rachel Barenblatt. Three months out, we enter the wilderness, a new landscape of the heart. The deal is this, Moshi says, coming down from the hilltop luminescent like the stars. We owe compassion to the widow and orphan, kindness to the stranger. In return, we become a nation of priests, treasured like gemstones. A scent rumbles through us like an earthquake, though no one quite understands. Moshi instructs us to wash our clothes, stay away from the mountain, get ready. Every heart beats, please let me live up to whatever is coming. And Mindy, I'm gonna pass it on to you for our scripture reading. Scripture reading today is from Exodus chapter 32, verses one through 14. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled about Aaron and said to him, come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, tear off the gold rings, which are in the ears of your, your wives, your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. Then all the people tore off the gold rings, which were in their ears, and brought them to Aaron. He took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. And they said, this, and then, and they said, this, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. So the next day they rose early and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, go down at once for your people whom you have brought up from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf and have worshiped it and have sacrificed to it and said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen these people and behold, they're an obstinate people. Now then let me alone that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them and I will make of you a great nation. Then Moses entreated the Lord his God and said, O oh Lord, why does your anger burn against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak saying, with evil intent, he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to destroy them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and change your mind about doing harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by yourself, and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens, and all this land of which I have spoken, I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord changed his mind about the harm which he said he would do to his people. My very favorite thing about this passage didn't make it into my sermon, so I want to tell it to you first. And that's how, if you look back at the passage, um, Moses and God go back and forth about who, whose people these are. God says, your people are stubborn and obstinate. And Moses says, you brought these people out of Israel, out of Egypt. These are your people. And they just sound very much like frustrated parents. Sort of a humanizing aspect. So in 1943, France Yearly Meeting composed their Yearly Meeting Epistle. Like the ones that um, Wilmington Yearly Meeting writes every year, it was addressed to friends everywhere. Unlike our epistles, though, it was sent from an occupied country in World War II. I've never seen the whole epistle, actually. 
I just know this one quote from it. We do not ask that you pray that we be safe. We ask that you pray that we be faithful. That's a whole sermon right there. If I had put those two sentences at the end of my sermon rather than at the beginning, I probably could have sat back down on our sort of facing bench and left you to think about it. We do not ask that you pray that we be safe. We ask that you pray that we be faithful. Ideally, we'd be both, right? But we, as you all know quite deeply, don't live in an ideal world. Sometimes we can't have both. So we rehashed Moses' life in the children's message. And I love that book. I love how he condenses the narrative into an easy to follow story and the illustrations are just fantastic. But anyone who takes on that kind of a job, though, has to pick through loads of details and choose the most necessary pieces featured. I don't fault his work, but he leaves out two pieces that I think are essential to this week's section of the larger story. So we know about the baby amid the bulrushes. We know that he was raised in Egyptian courts, that he killed a slave master, that he ran away as a refugee. The shepherd, there was the burning bush, there was the plagues, the let my people go. Here's the first thing that Wildsmith leaves out and that gets left out of a lot of popular retellings of the story. Moses' initial request was not that the slaves be freed forever. Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord God, the God of Israel, says, Let my people go so that they may hold a festival for me in the wilderness. They were just asking for a three-day pass, essentially. They just wanted Pharaoh to give them a few days to go out into the wilderness and worship their God. The let my people go part of that request is iconic. If you close your eyes for a moment, you can probably picture Charlton Heston saying it. Younger friends can probably picture the Prince of Egypt just as easily. But it's a two-part request. Let my people go so that they may worship. Small detail. I understand why Wild Smith left it out. If I were in charge of condensing the story for children, I might have left it out too. It definitely throws off the rhythm of the Pharaoh Pharaoh song that the kids sang for us last week. But it matters though. Because in biblical thought, there's never any separation between worshiping God and championing justice and compassion and freedom. You simply can't do one without the other. So Pharaoh lets the people go permanently. After the plague where the first four sons died, he decided he just didn't want the Hebrew people around anymore. And then he immediately changes his mind and sends an army after the escaping slaves. And you know the story, God parts the sea, the Hebrews travel through the closing waters, they, um, they sweep the Egyptian army away. And the first recorded song in scripture, I believe, is sung as praise after that event. The horse and the rider, God is flung into the sea. We do not ask that you pray that we be safe. We ask that you pray that we be faithful. One of the reactions that I have when I read that is, hey, I'll pray for whatever I want. If I want you to be safe, then I'll pray for you to be safe. You don't get to dictate what I want. You certainly don't get to dictate how honest I'm going to be with God about what I want. That's what I think prayer is, really, getting honest before God. Another reaction in light of today's story is that God wants God's people to be safe. God acts to save God's people. God is trying to lead these people into a promised land where their labor will build their own communities rather than being stolen by an empire. A third reaction, this more to the story, I'm really uncomfortable with the idea of singing praises over the death of other people. I don't know how to understand that as being faithful. And maybe that's because I've never had an oppressor like the Egyptians were in this story. 
if I were closer to the margins, if I identified more with marginalized people, maybe I'd get it. I promised you two things that Brian Wildsmith omitted. So let's keep going. From the split sea, it is on to Mount Sinai. That's where they're headed for this festival that Pharaoh didn't want to release them to attend. They're headed to Mount Sinai to worship. And there's manna and there's quail and there's water from the rock and then they are at the sacred mountain. They're there to make a covenant. They've been rescued from slavery, but it's not a one-sided deal. God has promised them freedom, but they have to make promises as well. Just imagine being in one of those tents, three days out of hell, hell being the only word, world that you knew, camped out in the wilderness with no plan, no provision for your family aside from sky bread, staring up at this mountain that is ringed with smoke and lightning and thunder. Take a moment and imagine that right down where it would hit in the pit of your stomach. Imagine wondering if you have just jumped from the boiling kettle into a much, much hotter frying pan. Imagine wondering what fidelity to this new overseer is going to cost you. God spoke what we call the Ten Commandments from the mountain, but it's not clear that the people could even understand. God said, no idols, and remember the Sabbath, and tell the truth, and be faithful. But people saw the lightning and the thunder, and they heard the trumpet, and they saw the smoke, and they trembled. It doesn't say they understood anything at all. They stayed at a distance, and they said to Moses, speak to us yourself, and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us or we will die. When God said no idols, it's not clear that they even understood the words. So Moses disappeared up the mountain into this thick darkness and the people stayed at a distance. And Moses was gone for a long time, lost in this thick thunderous darkness. And as readers, we get chapters and chapters of exposition here. The Lord and Moses are busy and we know it. God is giving Moses detailed laws about all sorts of things. It takes a while. But back at the camp, at the base of the mountain, it just looks like there was this prophet who came with signs and wonders and split the sea open and let them cross safely and led them here to this mountain in the middle of freaking no place with nothing to eat but sky bread and then disappeared. He's just gone. Maybe he was working for Pharaoh all along. Maybe they've just been led out there to die. Maybe this liberating God is actually kind of fickle and he's taken Moses as a sacrifice. Who knows? I think this is a good story for these days because people moving through transitions are desperate for security. You hear this, really, in almost everything we say about COVID-19. We're looking for a new normal. When will things get back to normal? What is the new normal going to look like? If you had told us seven months ago that nothing would feel normal now, that I would be preaching in a shed at camp, how many of us would have been able to accept that? Seven months? What if in a year nothing feels normal? People going through transitions are desperate for security. And so the story of the Hebrews here should be a cautionary tale for us. When nothing feels normal and they don't know what's coming next, when their leader has maybe been eaten by a smoke monster on a mountain and they're in the wilderness and they don't know where to turn, they do what people do. They build their own sense of security. They build an idol and they worship that. Aaron takes their jewelry and melts it down and fashions it into a golden calf. When the people saw the calf, they said, these are your gods, Israel, who bought you up out of Egypt. That may not have been the response that Aaron was intending. He was just trying to give them something concrete to focus on, something that included a little bit of what each of them had to give, something that could give them a sense of security. But when Aaron saw that the people were willing to recognize the golden calf as a god, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow there will be a festival for the Lord. A festival to the Lord was the whole reason that they were in the wilderness, right? 
That's why they did this. Aaron doesn't know what's going on up on the mountain, but he seizes the opportunity to just push ahead, right on schedule. Wanted to feel secure. Wanted to know what was coming. So it was festival time. Wildsmith's illustrations include this festive scene of celebrating around the golden calf, but they don't include the tense conversation that happens on the mountain because it says Moses was angry, but what Exodus says is God was angry. The Lord wants to burn angry against these people and destroy them. He saved them from slavery and they are offering worship to something they just made yesterday and it is all too much. So the Lord tells Moses to step back so that righteous anger can destroy the people. And then the Lord promises a mighty nation of people would be made out of Moses. That would technically still fulfill the promise to Abraham. His children would be as many as the stars and a blessing to the whole world. There would just be this bottleneck at Moses's generation where the whole thing had to be restarted. But Moses says no. That's the other essential piece of this story. Moses says no. Moses defends the people before God as they are down at the base of the mountain worshiping their idol. He lays aside the idea that he could be the patriarchal progenitor of the people in, like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And instead he intercedes for his kinfolk calls on the Lord to remember. Remember your servants. Don't destroy them. We do not ask that you pray that we be saved. We ask that you pray that we be faithful. Moses is a hero of mine, and he's a hero of an awful lot of people who end up in leadership positions everywhere. Because no matter what kind of place you are leading in, whether it is a school or a business or a family or a church, there comes a point when you think, wow, God could really destroy these people and they would deserve it. And I've got to pray for them anyway. And I don't mean to direct that explicitly at any of you. I mean to point out the ways in which you find this to be true in your own leadership journeys, that there are times when you have to intercede for people who don't deserve it because they weren't faithful, but Moses still wanted them to be safe. And on some level, I think they were unfaithful because they were so thankful to be safe that they wanted a place to pour that thankfulness into. And an idol was the first thing available. Seeking one another's safety is a form of faithfulness. But we have to be faithful first. So Moses came back down from the mountain the second time with a new copy of the commandments and a whole new covenant in his head. And the deal, as the poem that Rachel read offered, was this. We owe compassion to the widow and the orphan, kindness to the stranger. And in return, we become a nation of priests, treasured like gemstones. We allow those in our borders to live freely, and we get to live freely. We get to speak to those on the margins, and as we do so, we become channels of God's mercy. But in order for it to happen, we have to be faithful before we're safe. We do not ask that you pray that we be safe. We ask that you pray that we be faithful. I don't know much about Quakerism in 1943 in France, but I do know that the faithful choices of French resistors kept many people safe. Are we willing to risk our own safety if that's how we can best be faithful? Are we willing to let go of the idols that provide us with a sense of false security and rest instead entirely on God?
This morning, um, I'm thinking of Mary Catherine Hilberg, and uh, we've missed being in the presence with her in our meeting for a few years now, but now she is gone from this earth. But I, I appreciate her as a model of justice. You could always depend on her to get um, uh, measured uh, thoughtfulness about whatever issue arose. And uh, she was an encourager. And, um, and she loved to have fun just as much as anyone else. And an asset to our meeting and the community and a role model for women. May she be in peace right now in heaven. Our closing hymn this morning is Holy, Holy, Holy. We're going to try to do this as a congregational hymn, so if everybody but Barb can stay muted, we can all sing along. You, for folks on Zoom, the words will be popping up in the chat. For folks out here, we've got it in our bulletins. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh. 
Thank you, Barb. Marianne, if you want to take it away with the benediction. As we leave this place, let God replace our golden calves and place wholehearted worship at the center of all we say and do. Let God guide our lives and our encounters this week. And then we might truly see the blessings wholeheartedness brings. Go with God's love, Jesus' gentle care, and the Spirit's breath inspiring this day and all our days. Amen. Thank you.